Good morning. Welcome to the camera store. It's Evelyn coming to you live from the camera store for our hybrid event today. We are talking about drones and dronings, regulations, creativity, having fun with drones for video production. Uh, so we're going to have two guests today. One we have in store. This is Joey Hubbard. And we're also going to have another guest joining us online. Uh, in the store on our giant 85 inch TV, we have Don Joyce from Don Drones On, who has a lot of great information about Canadian regulations some new changes, things that might not be as difficult as you think they are, um, but really, really good key information. They'll be about the second half of uh, the talk today. Um, we also have DJI in the house today with Yannick Michaud. Hello, Yannick. <laughs> <Woo. laughs> um, for those that are here in the store today, we do have some drones. You can come take a look at lots of really good stuff. Um, but there's a lot of really neat things happening in the world of droning. So we really appreciate all you guys joining us. And of course, with our live audience, Audience joining from home, uh, you stayed home with the snowy weather if you're in Calgary, you can participate, ask lots of questions. We will be doing a Q&A at the end for both our in-person audience and online, so we'll get as many questions as we can towards the end. So Joey, why don't you take it away and welcome everyone. Awesome. Uh, I'll let you maybe do the computer change yes, if that's I can okay. Do the computer. Awesome. All right. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. All right. So yeah, my name is Joey. Um, this is Dom. We've got a here, let's wait till we get to our slide that's got our beautiful faces on it. Just a second. So yeah, like uh, Evelyn said, today we're just gonna be talking about droning in Canada. I'll be kind of you know talking about the creative side of things a little bit, you know, my journey with my drone, kind of where I started, lots of mistakes I made along the way. Um, yeah. 
And just for people that are tuning in online today, I just kind of wanted to share how rugged and amazing our audience is that's in store, what they had to weather in order to be here. So this is our drive-in. Um, it was beautiful. So land speed records. But all jokes aside, actually, just for, again, for people online, the weather, this is what it looks like right now. I filmed this, like, probably about 45 minutes ago just from my patio and like it's snowing hard. So I was gonna pop the drone up, that didn't happen. Anyways, moving on. <laughs> no, don't lose sight. No, no. There we go, okay. So yeah, I guess just to give a little bit of context, my name is Joey, I work full time in marketing. So droning is something I like to do for fun. Um, I get to use my camera and my drone for my work off and on, which is great. And uh, Don, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, so I'm Don Joyce. I'm in Ontario where there is almost no snow right now, but uh, I have a, a web cha a YouTube channel called Don Drones On, or you just look for my name, Don Joyce. I'm also the president of the Drone Pilot Association of Canada. And uh, yeah, so all things good. Oh, back to you, Joy. Thanks, Don. Perfect. Let's not replay that video again. Okay, perfect. So I think before we get into the meat and potatoes of today's presentation, we should talk about, you know, why should you start droning, right? We always hear the horror stories about losing your drone, it flies away, there's a bunch of rules. Why would you even do this to get started? Well, the first reason is perspective. You know, if you're a photographer or videographer, you get used to a very linear way of looking at things. And when you start using a drone, it completely changes the way you create. And I think that just goes into number two, which is pushing your creativity. Um, anything that's got a controller <laughs> is amazing. And it really changes the way you interact with media and as well the community. So, I mean, even Don being here today um, is a testament to that community, right? So, you know, I'm not an expert on drone rules. I reached out to him a couple years ago and said, hey, like, I want to put out some drone content on my channel about the rules, but I'm not an expert. I can't speak to that. So we connected, we started making videos together and fast forward a bit, now we're here. So, you know, there is a definitely a very strong community in Canada around droning and Don will be able to speak on that one a little bit more. Don, what do you think about the uh, community for droning in Canada? It's growing. It's really, really growing. I mean, there's over 100,000 registered or certified drone pilots right now in Canada. And I, I would say most of us, you know, tend to, you know, sit in the field with our controllers and fly alone. But there's a growing movement towards getting together. Uh, I was at a sky meet, what we, what we call a sky meet in Ottawa just a, a couple of days ago. You get to meet other people enjoying the hobby, enjoying what they're doing. And it's wonderful. And then, and when summer gets here, and it will get here, we'll have even more of those happening across Canada. Awesome. And Don, is it warmer you are right now, or is it uh, snowy like Calgary? It's plus five. It's plus five. The sun's out. It's uh, a little chilly, but but it's wonderful to be outside. Awesome. Thanks, Don. Uh, thank you. Great. So. I just kind of put a little montage together of some clips that I did when I first started droning. Um, so we'll just quickly look at those, then we'll go into the slides. I'll talk a little bit more about the drones I use, some stories of things that went well, some things that didn't go so well. So yeah, here we go. So I know what you're thinking. Wait, sorry. I'm gonna pause a little bit. So Canadaskus, yes or no? Can we drone in Canadaskus? Exactly, certain areas. Most areas we can't. So I was actually um, down by Moose Mountain for this one. So if you're watching and you're a rules aficionado, it was allowed. And also that Camor shot, same thing. It was outside the Camor Sea limits, right before the Spray Lakes Park starts, um, right at that sort of gray area, right? So it's a good tip, find gray areas to shoot. <laughs> oh, no, no, we're just gonna... Okay, I'll just restart it, sorry. <laughs>
So yeah, just a bunch of different footage. I just thought it'd be a fun way to get the ball rolling here. So I started droning in Seoul, South Korea. So when I finished university, I said, hey man, I got an arts degree. <laughs> there wasn't a lot of jobs at the time. I want to do something with that. So I moved overseas to Korea as an ESL teacher. And I spent about six months teaching um, when I met my future employer who said, hey, I've got this nonprofit. You talk a lot. Maybe you could do marketing. So I started working for him. And when I went back to work for him, because I did have to obviously do a visa run, I thought, I want to get a drone. I'm going to be hosting this YouTube channel. I don't see a lot of drones. You know, this was 20, it's a while ago. <laughs> it's about five, six years ago. So there wasn't necessarily as many drones being used in Korea at that point. So I came home and I thought, I'm going to get this drone. It's going to be great. Went back. Craigslist, I thought, this is going to be the place to buy a used drone. Because, you know, if you're a young student, you're not going to necessarily have a big budget. So went on Craigslist, found a guy selling a Phantom 3 Pro, and I got scammed. He was in a different city. He took all my money and disappeared. So on my next trip back home, I bought one on Kijiji <laughs> and then went back and took it with me. Um, and it really was my first chance to learn how to fly. And I mean, I know the Phantom 3 was a big, big drone, but it was like flying a Hummer. <laughs> it was very forgiving. It could handle winds. And, you know, it was just a really great experience. But I actually did get my money back from the scam, the Korean police department figured out who it was and got me my money back. So it was great, it worked out okay. But when you're first learning how to fly, I think necessarily going out to places like this aren't necessarily the best because you're in high wind, it can be unpredictable, right? So when, when you first learn to fly, don't do what I did, <laughs> right? Take some time, go to fields. Um, but yeah, fast forwarding a little bit, I, We'll make this presentation. So you would suggest I just do that by, on my backyard. Yeah, backyard's great, as long as you're not near an airport, and depending on the way you're drone. Don will get into that, though. So I was carrying that thing around in my backpack, and it was a full drone backpack, every single shoot I would do, and my back was getting sore, and I finally realized I'm not using this thing nearly as much, because of course I was on camera a lot talking, so I ended up leaving it behind all the time in favor of taking my camera with me to shoot talking head stuff. So I ended up selling it, and then I got the Mini 1, and I definitely crashed a couple, <laughs> but it was sort of the first crack by DJI at doing a micro drone, and the rules around micro drones are a lot more forgiving than they are on big drones, and it changed the way I used my drone, because I could just fit it into my camera bag. I didn't have to decide, okay, I'm taking my drone or I'm taking my camera. You could take both. And I mean, yes, the sensor was a little bit smaller than it was on the Phantom 3 Pro at the time, but the footage was still really clean. So this shot I did in um, Gangnam. Have you guys heard Gangnam Style, the song? Yeah. Yeah, so this is the city that that's based upon. And um, we got this rooftop um, just near the Pakoda building, and it was completely empty, and we were allowed to fly. And we actually were technically allowed to fly. We looked up all the rules. We made sure that this area on the drone map app that they have in Korea was a area that was permitted for drone flight, micro drone specifically. And we popped it off the roof, got a couple quick shots. And then at that time, I think the mini one, I'll have to ask the, the, the specialist in the corner there, but it was a Wi-Fi connection on the mini one, right? Yeah, so it lost connectivity a couple times, obviously, right? Because there's a lot of signal interference when you're in a city like that. Um, well, were you on the, on the ground or were you in a building? I was on a rooftop. So, you were in a yeah, rooftop. so I got access to the emergency exit on the top of a building and then I took a ladder up a bit further oh, <laughs> and then took it off from there. Because in the end of the day, like where, whenever you're flying like this, you want to have clear line of sight and you want to be able to actually know where your drone is. And especially if it's an area you're not familiar with, being right. safe and not putting people at risk is everything, right? So, you know, this drone probably flew 60 feet away from me. <laughs> that was it. Anything How far would your drone fly from where you are? This one was 60 feet away from me. That was it. 60 feet away. Horizontal. Horizontal, yeah. Exactly, because I already had the altitude I needed, right? I didn't have to fly it. Anything past that. Nope, don't play again. Let's go next. Um, and that was kind of the point at which, in my droning journey, I was like, man, like I'm only doing video. What can I do photo-wise? It's a small sensor. What kind of images can I really get? And that was when I started playing around doing uh, panorama and HDR. So when you've got a smaller sensor on your camera, obviously the dynamic range might not be quite as great as what you're used to if you're coming from using a full-frame camera. So I started doing um, HDR merges, and it would only be three to four photos shooting in full manual, and the dynamic range of the drone just 
tripled basically from what I was used to for stills. And same thing for doing uh, panoramas. You know, this one I shot, yeah, I think it was yeah, seven, eight images. And I shot it in full manual. And I, whenever you're doing a panorama like that, you just hover in one place and you just pan. That's it. You never change altitude, never change positioning. Um, and I think this photo took me about three minutes with uh, Affinity Pro to stitch together. That was it, right? So I mean, obviously, now that we have technology that will line up your photos and stitch them together for you, it makes it a lot easier. But Having this flexibility to be able to shoot this way really allowed me to get more out of that drone. And it just it blew my mind the types of images you could uh, capture. But with anything, when you're first learning how to use it, you make mistakes, right? Not everything goes according to plan. Uh, my first Mini 1, I flew backwards into a castle at night, and it crashed. That was the first one I lost. But that really wasn't my biggest mistake. My biggest mistake was actually at um, Inguansan Mountain in Seoul. So at the time, I didn't know that there was a whole app, right? An app that would actually where you could fly. I was new to the space, and I mean, I should have done my research, but I thought, okay, government buildings, DMZ, and military installations. Those are the three things that I could find online that without a doubt, you cannot fly near. So I was actually right near the step right here, and I thought, okay, the presidential palace is about six kilometers to the left, and aside from that, it's just a mountain. Should be able to fly. Pop my drone up. I think I flew probably about 10 feet away from me, and I start getting this warning. Not registered area, cannot fly. Brought it back right away. I'm like looking at the map, can't see anything. I'm like, okay, well, just to be safe, I'm not gonna fly anymore. Keep hiking, get to the top of the mountain, and I see the tiniest military installation you've ever seen. It was like a shed. <laughs> and this guy comes up and taps me on the shoulder, and he says, hey, are, are you drone? I said, yeah, I'm drone. He said, okay, we go now. So him and about 25 other Korean soldiers escorted me back down to the mountain to this exact same spot, and then Humvee rolled up with military intelligence officers, and they said, hey, we need to make sure that you're not a spy. And I said, okay. Cool, this is a great Sunday. Uh, so they had me pop my drone back up and they said, show us where you flew. So I flew it 10 feet away, brought it right back. They're like, okay, you didn't go too far. I said, yeah, and they said, do you have the footage? And I said, yeah, I didn't delete it. Here's my memory card, you can keep it. You can keep my drone at this point, right? Just take everything, just let me, let me go home. Um, so they said, all right, we, we need a few minutes to uh, confer with our, with our senior management. <laughs> so they go off, they're talking and I'm freaking out. And, through all this process, they are doing their best to speak English to me, which I feel so grateful for because I'm a guest in their country, right? Whenever you travel somewhere and English isn't the first language, it's always good to assume, you know, you might have a language barrier. So I had, I had Google, uh, was it Google Translate open and I was punching stuff in. They're like, that, that, that's not how we speak. Just <laughs> talk to us slowly. They come back, they said, okay, we, we've conferred with our uh, uh, experts and we've decided you're not a North Korean spy. I said, okay, all right, party on, that's great. They said, um, there's an app. I said, there's an app, and then they gave me a pamphlet. <laughs> so many people had done this that there was a pamphlet. So they gave me a pamphlet and then I found the uh, Korean drone app that showed you where you could and couldn't fly and it accounted for everything. But the thing that saved me in all of this was the DJI app because it told me, you cannot fly here, and I got that notification. If I'd flown any further, there could have been more repercussions, right? right? So the moral of this story is anywhere you go, there will be heavy regulations. Expect that, and do your due diligence. Because I mean, yeah, I Googled it, and I thought, okay, like, don't go near government buildings. That should be it, right? But there was a lot more to it. There was a lot more rules and regs. And after this happened to me, I flew with a lot more confidence because I said, hey, I actually know I can fly here. That rooftop shot I got in Gangnam, I can do that. It is allowed. There aren't rules against it. You just have to use some common sense. Don't endanger people. Don't dive bomb skyscrapers, right? Be smart about it. But um, it was really an eye-opening experience, and it really al allowed me, when I came back to Canada, to be prepared for the rules that we have, which, again, Don will be able to speak to that more than I can. And the other thing when you're using different drones is knowing the limitations of that drone. Different drones have different sensors and different AI capabilities. So I eventually got rid of my Mini 1 and I thought, I want to get a Mavic Air. This is a cool drone. It's made out of metal. It, it'll last longer than the two other ones I crashed. So I got a Mavic um, Air and I thought, I'm going to try out the AI flying mode. And this happened. The drone didn't crash. But 
it got way too close to that rock. So that's another good example where I'm in a field, I'm thinking, oh yeah, like this is a good place to practice. I'm just gonna put it in full auto mode and let it fly for me. And it got too close, right? And I'm surprised it didn't crash. It was a miracle that it didn't. Um, but that's another example where when you do start leaning on those um, drone intelligent features where it flies for you, know what it does, know what its limitations are, and know also how to pull it out of that mode. I was able to pull it out right at that point and bring it back to me, but it took me a second. I was messing around on my phone, because you know on the older drones you had to put your phone into the controller, um, and it wasn't ideal, right? I really should have practiced that mode in the field away from all of this where it was just me as the subject before trying it here. So learn from my failures. <laughs> There's lots. So, so you're saying your, your, your controller have that autopilot thing that you don't need to manipulate. You don't need to manipulate, but you need to watch it. That's the point, right? Because at the end of the day, it's making calculations and looking at what's around you, but as the pilot, you're the only one that has a full scale, oh, this is everything that's going on around me. Because the drone's got a limited field of view, and it's making those calculations and decisions based on what it can see. But again, it's not like a 360 camera, right? I mean, the sensors, yes, they definitely do pick up things that are nearby, but you know, take the Mini 3 Pro, for instance, great front and bottom sensors, there's no sensors on the rear. Okay. Right, so it's not gonna account for things when it's flying backwards. There are on the rear. Oh, the, oh sorry. Not on the side. Oh, the side, sorry, yeah. side. And I will tell you what he's saying is gospel. <laughs> Don't trust everything about the automation. I will get DTI, <laughs> all right? Uh, Don't trust it 100%. Always have your finger on the controller on because the you don't know if it sees what it sees. All right, what? That last bit, just so we're on the computer. Um, my bank account number? Just the last bit you're saying. Um, <laughs> yeah, always get ready with your finger on the controller. Always, because it might not see a little twig or a cable or a 10 ton rock, but it all depends which drone you're flying. Is it an older drone which doesn't have any sensors? Or does it have, you, do you have the new Mavic 3 Pro or Mavic 4 Pro which has better uh, capabilities and better AI and better uh, um, um, how do you say in English? Sensors on the side and the front. Each one you have to learn properly. And what he's saying is gospel. Always be ready. Don't take anything for granted. Yes. Yeah. yeah. When you were flying near that rock, um, were you just controlling your, your drone? I know you didn't have, or it was on automatic, but were you just looking at a little speck or did you have a controller, if that's what it's called, where you could see out of a, lens, a camera lens of your drone? Uh, both, actually. So I was only about 60 feet away from the rock when I was filming, so I could see my drone in the air and also on the, on the screen on the controller, okay. how close it was getting. And that's when I started to freak out, because I yeah. was like, oh god, it's getting close, it's getting close, and it's still going, and I'm trying to figure out how to get out of this auto mode, and I finally did. But it was one of those things where I wish in hindsight I had known how to get out of that mode qu more quickly prior to trying that out and also yeah. have tried that out somewhere where there wasn't other yeah. people and also a large 10 ton rock. <laughs> so yeah, you know, it's one of those things that the AI modes on all the drones that DJI produces are amazing, but to the specialist's point, you need to know the limitations of your drone and you need to be prepared for anything because this is best case scenario, right? But it's not always gonna be best case and the drone only sees what it sees, so. But yeah, I ended up crashing my Mini 1 and crashed it again and then I decided, okay, I wanna get a bigger drone, so that's when I got the Mavic Air. So one of the first trips I took it on was actually about two years ago now to uh, Wyoming and there was a lot more um, lax rules I found when I was visiting on uh, where you could and couldn't fly. I mean, yes, national parks, obviously not, but as long as you didn't have like a three kilo drone, it was a bit more flexible. So I just did this little montage just to show you guys. But when I was flying all of these shots, I was in full auto on the ISO, but aside from that, all these shots I flew controlling it. I didn't trust any of the um, auto modes just because these were places I had never visited before. And that's something as well, when, you've go when you're going to a place you haven't been before, 
try to control the drone as much as you can. Don't lean on those features. Um, I only really lean now on um, AI flying when it's a place I've flown like three, four times, just because that way then I know what to expect. Um, but yeah, it was a really beautiful state to visit. I, I, we decided that we wanted to do Wyoming in uh, 48 hours, so we drove around Wyoming 48 hours as much as we could, slept in the car, and uh, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun, but a lot of these spots we went to were just um, spectacular, but on the edges of the parks, right? So we would look at the park map, make sure we weren't inside, um, and yeah, we definitely got some, some cool shots, so I'll just let finish playing, and then we can... Keep on going. We had some really low cloud cover there. And that's another thing as well. Uh, visibility is key. So as you guys can see, I didn't fly into the cloud. I flew underneath it. I didn't want to lose it up there because at the end of the day, um, line of sight really is everything when you're flying. And that's the other thing as well is when you do lose line of sight, you're not just putting your drone at risk, you're putting people at risk. And that's really what it comes down to is making sure that you're protecting people around you. We want to keep it a safe hobby, right? And when you can't see your drone or you don't know where it is, you know, yeah, go for it. Sorry, didn't want to interrupt, but when you're speaking of always have that line of sight, so are you saying even if you are looking at your controller and looking through a camera lens on your drone, that that's not good enough? Do you need to have the actual visual of your drone? Best case scenario, yes. That's not always going to be the case. But yeah, line of sight means you can physically see where your drone has gone. So. It's not always going to work that way, right? Sometimes it could be darker out, the lighting might not be great, you might be flying super far away. Um, in those scenarios, you have to trust your judgment and you have to really check the camera, pin, um, pan up and down, see what's going on around you. Um, but yeah, I hope that answers your question. Best case scenario, you can physically see it and you see it on the, like you're watching the feed, right? It's a bit of both. And I mean, Don, you'll have to uh, tell me if I'm right on this one, but uh, doesn't the um, drone regulation stipulate it's good to have a spotter as well? Sorry, I was muted. Uh, either yourself as the pilot or a visual observer that has direct communication with you somehow. Um, can have visual line of sight to the drone, and that is seeing it with your eyes or, or your spotter's eyes. Uh, that's the regulation. Um, it, it doesn't strictly apply to micro drones, drones under 250 grams, but it's always a best practice in, in any regard. Excellent. Thanks, Don. Yeah, I hope that answers your question. Um, no, say, yeah. Question. Um, well, yes. I can speak to that, Joey. Yeah, go ahead, Don. <laughs> yeah, so okay, FPV flying, and for those who don't know how that works, you basically have a goggle or a set of goggles over your eyes, so you can't see the environment. You're you're seeing what the camera sees on the drone strictly, and you're flying it that way. It's 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 an amazing experience, but from a regulatory perspective, because your vision is blocked. You always need a spotter to be with you, watching what your drone is doing and making sure that you're not running into something or, or there's no aircraft nearby and that sort of thing. So with an FPV flight, the regulation is you must have a spotter with you. Great question, though. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> that's why we got Dawn, right? Because they're, they're, that's the other thing as well. I only know what I know. And within the drone space, there are so many nuances depending on the type of drone you're piloting and the purpose you're piloting it for, right? If you're just doing recreational, there's different rules. If you're doing commercial, whole nother kettle of fish, which uh, Dawn can probably share more on in a bit. Um, so yeah, fast forward a bit. I obviously came home to Canada and I wanted to start flying my drone in Calgary. So I bought the Mini 3 Pro and it's been my drone now, I'd say coming up on two years and I love it a ton. It's the, my favorite drone I've ever owned. Having the dedicated controller with the screen definitely changed everything because before it's like, okay, gotta put your phone in and oh my God, my phone's dying to bat, right? right? It, was, it was a whole thing. So having a controller that actually had a screen on it definitely helped a lot and on those bright days when you're out shooting and you can't really see the screen they get uh, there's like a boost brightness mode so you can get it even brighter um, the real reason I bought this drone was because of the true vertical right so I mean if you're a horizontal video creator when vertical video came out it was definitely something that was frustrating and something that we don't necessarily love but if you've got a camera that can shoot in true vertical it's like okay I'm still using the full sensor I'm still getting all that quality 
Um, so yeah, these were just some stills I took around the city. I shot these in, I think it was ISO 500, full manual, true vertical. Um, but these ones aren't uh, HDR. This is just straight out of camera JPEG, which is some light color grading. And I just kind of wanted to show you guys like how far the sensor technology has come, right? Those earlier images we saw for the Mini 1 were awesome, but I had to stack them up. And even stacked up, I wouldn't say they were anywhere close to what the uh, JPEGs are out of the um, uh, Mini 3 Pro. And uh, this shot on the end there, that's a full down vertical shot of the uh, bridge over in, um, I forget the name of the park, the one near the uh, zoo, East Village. Anyways, uh, yeah, just kind of a fun one. Any questions or can I keep going? Cool, I only got a couple minutes because I gotta get over to Dawn. Um, and then, yeah, I live in the Beltline here in the city, so I just took this one off the um, uh, High Park over just off uh, 10th Avenue. It's about three blocks from where we're uh, filming today, actually, this live cast. And yeah, it's a really great spot because you get the altitude and you can look ahead to see where your drone's going. So, you know, with any of this stuff, try not to fly during rush hour, try not to fly over a billion people. The reason I like this flight path is because you've got the tracks and there's this whole building complex right there. There's not a lot of people, right? So you can fly over there. It's a lot lower risk for both you and uh, people around you. This shot I got here, this was where I selected the... Um, Calgary Tower is a point of interest, and then I just did a simple pan left to right. Um, that's my favorite auto mode on the new uh, Mini 3 Pro, is the ability to set a point of interest and then just manually fly it, but have it always keep it in center of frame. It's a really, really powerful tool. And there's a whole bunch of auto modes I don't use, but uh, yeah, go ahead. So notwithstanding your comment about that clear flight path, mm -hmm. you still are in control airspace. So controlled airspace, that's a, a great point. Um, micro drones you can use in downtown Calgary. If it's under 250 grams, as long as you... Is that, is, it is, is it? It's under 250. Yeah, now that being said, if you... can fly that on a basic R-pass system. You can fly that on a basic R-pass certificate. Yeah. 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 Yeah, uh, Don, Don will be able to <laughs> elaborate on that one. Um, with a micro drone, you don't need to have a license or a permit. You can, fly, and again, keep in mind, guys, this changes city to city. I cannot like highlight that enough. Canmore, you can't fly. Edmonton, there's a whole bunch of areas you can't fly. Calgary's got different bylaws as they pertain to micro drones. I had to like find the actual PDF that had that in it before I felt comfortable flying there. And as a rule of thumb. Um, the Calgary Tower, don't go higher than it. <laughs> as long as you stay at, right around that, uh, that um, altitude or lower, you're okay. You're technically within the rules. Um, yeah, anyway, moving on. So hyperlapses are something that I really, really love on the uh, Mini 3 Pro. Um, I use the Waypoint one. So what I'll do in that mode is I will take a series of photos that will guide the drone. So I actually send it on its path. And then when I hit start, it's just gonna go right back to where I took that first photo and take a series of images and stitch them together. That's my favorite mode because you're actually able to see where it's gonna go before you decide, all right, I'm gonna take 15 minutes worth of images on this flight path. Now, that being said, obviously things can change within that 15 minutes, so it's not like I'm pulling my phone out and texting and just thinking, oh, no, 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 I'm watching that thing, watching the screen and making sure that, you know, if birds are coming, I bring it back, I pull it out of that mode. And that's one of the things that's really great about the uh, Mini 3 Pro is pulling it out of that mode is easy. Just hit the little X icon, bring it on home, right? So hyperlapses is definitely something that uh, is fun. And you can do it in true vertical too. So you can go into true vertical, do the, so that's usually what I do is if I'm doing a video for my YouTube channel, and my Instagram, I will do the first one in horizontal for YouTube, and then I'll bring it right back to the identical flight path, but in true vertical, so that way then if I want to post on Instagram in full quality, I can. Okay, so the Mini 3 Pro for panoramas is a lot of fun. Um, you can really get some great images, and I actually really like the JPEGs straight out of camera, so this was a series of 10 images I took, and you kind of start getting that fish eye once you kind of hit that 10 image um, number, just depending on how much you pan each time. Um, I'd say I was probably turning it per image if I was to simulate it like that much. So really, really small amounts of movement. You don't need to move it too much. Um, and then yeah, I just put it into Affinity Pro, which if you use Capture One is sort of uh, the Photoshop equivalent to um, Adobe. 
And yeah, it stitched it together. It took about two minutes and I got this image and I was just like, man, this is awesome. Like it's just such a cool angle and I, the lighting during this time of day is great. I mean, yeah, if you fly the Mini 3 Pro when it's the middle of the night, you're not gonna get great image quality. But if you fly during blue hour, golden hour, during the day, you're gonna get great shots. A lot of the other stuff on our gentleman's table to the right here could do better in low light than mine can, but uh, you can get, you still get some great shots. Uh, this was one I took just before the Rockies. Um, same thing, five images just stitched together. This was just right before golden hour about three weeks ago. And just to give you guys context on the area I was flying here, um, this is right, do you guys know where Lactus Arcs is? Yeah, so Lactus Arcs, if you go too far in, is in the provincial park. But Sieb and Exshaw don't have rules against micro drones. And technically the little hamlet that was right there was this gray area where you could fly. Now, that being said, there's a neighborhood there. I don't wanna bother people. I'm not gonna bomb it like two kilometers away and bring it back. I put it straight up in the air, took my photos, brought it right back down. And I think that's one of the things is even though you are allowed to do something does not mean you should abuse that rule. People live there, people have privacy and you don't want to upset folks, right? I had a guy comment on one of my rules videos that said, hey, I've, I've bought drones to shoot up in the air to take down other people's drones, right? You have to keep in mind, people have different perceptions of the hobby and the interactions might all, always be positive. Yeah. Just wondering if you had wanted to would it be a huge ordeal to get permission? Yes, it's very complicated to get permission from uh, provincial and federal parks. Um, but Don will be able to speak more on that one. Don, I'm almost done, I promise. <laughs> uh, and this is why I use the Mini Three Pro. It's small, compact, and I can take it with me everywhere. So for my real estate shoots that are a little bit closer to the airport, I'm not gonna pop this thing up 200 feet in the air, but I can fly it legally nearby as long as I don't go past that 100 foot um, uh, height altitude. Yeah, altitude. And with this one, I probably popped it up 30 feet in the air, right? Um, but great for doing photos, great for doing video. Um, and then also as well, I like using it with my there. So this was one where I did do the full auto um, uh, AI flight mode that is called Master Shots on the Mini 3 Pro. And this is a spot I've flown probably 65 times at this point. So I was able to pop it in the air, set my POI, and then just send it. But again, with that, still watching it nonstop. But you can get some beautiful shots with the master shots modes. One thing though you, do, you should know is you can change the resolution. That was something I didn't realize you could do. You can go from like, I think it goes up to 4K on the Mini 3 Pro. So if you wanna get that 4K 30, you definitely can. Um, and yeah, I think that was, is that all my slides? Yeah, then that is it for me. Uh, before we go on to Don's part of the presentation, any questions I can answer, comments, concerns? Maybe this is for another person, but you're mentioning 100 feet. Is that, is that a like, legal limit you can't fly higher? I'll let Don speak on that one. Sorry, I, okay. I, to my understanding, I, I couldn't hear guess, but uh, Don will be able to uh, better speak to that one. Yeah. One thing before Don starts, I don't, um, maybe get the guy to turn the volume up a little bit for the old people. Yeah, 100%. Don. Yeah, I think we've got it. Yeah. You mentioned earlier about uh, having an app while you were in Korea. What is the best app local uh, to you see where you can? Or is it just um, it's DJI Fly is great. The app that they have was actually one developed by the Korean government. Um, I can't recall what it's called off the top of my head. Um, if you want to connect with me afterwards, I can, uh, I can, I can show it to you on my phone. But yeah, that's a great question. Because, yeah, in every country, um, doesn't necessarily have an app, right? But if they do have a, an active map that can show you where you can and can't, like that's the best thing. But when you're looking at those maps, keep in mind that that might not include um, provincial or local bylaws, right? Luckily with them, it did, it, it was all encompassing, but I think Don will be able to probably speak to the Canadian version of that app and uh, some of the limitations the uh, Nav Canada map has. But uh, any other questions or shall I uh, sit down? We'll let Don take it away. Okay. All right. Thanks very much, Joey. That was really interesting. Um, I couldn't see the images that you were showing, so I'm going to be looking at the recording later. It'll be quite quite cool. So, um, yeah, my name is Don Joyce. Uh, I have a YouTube channel called Don Drones On that is focused mostly on regulations around uh, Canadian drone flying. 
Um, but I also have my own videos on there, cinematic videos and other weird stuff sometimes. But uh, yeah, so I was invited here today to talk about regulations. And I want to try to keep it upbeat because when you start getting into some of these regulations, it's a lot of, no, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. So it, it helps to know a little bit about why the regulations are structured as they are and um, try to focus on what you can do because it's it's a lot of fun. So let me share my screen here. I have a little presentation. Okay, let me know when you can see that. You can see it? Okay, there we go. All right, so what I'm going to be talking about is who, what, when, where, and how to deal with droning in Canada. And you'll notice that I'm missing the why, because everybody knows the why. I don't have to cover that. It's fun. It's so fun. It's it's an incredible experience to fly a drone. And uh, so let's not forget that when we're talking about all these these horrible regulations and things. So I, I mentioned about it helps to understand a little bit about the structure. And the main thing here is that the rules are set up to talk about risk. So they're designed to do three things. Minimize the risk to manned aviation and people on the ground. That's first and foremost. Second of all, they're actually designed to make it easy to fly drones in relatively low risk situations. And if you are flying in a more high risk operation, you can do it as long as you have the right training, certification and knowledge. So it's really about the, the risk. And as such, the, the rules are, and regulations are structured in at present four different layers, starting from the bottom with what are called micro drones, drones under 250 grams, then moving up to basic operations, advanced operations and RPAs, they, uh, the regulations talk about remotely piloted aircraft, that's an RPA, over 25 kilograms. And those are what are called more complex operations. So let's walk through each one of those and touch on the, the, the very minimal amount of information you need to know. So starting with micro drones, when, when you're flying a drone under 250 grams, and I don't know whether you can still see my screen or not, but um, a micro drone is anything like a, a DJI Mini 4 Pro that I have here, the Mini 3 Pro that Joey talked about, and there's there's many others. There's also other brands. One of my go-to drones, in fact, is this strange little device called a Hover Air X1. And it folds up so tiny, it'll fit literally in your back pocket. It's all protected. It's got a great little camera. It's basically a, a selfie drone, but I actually use it quite a bit. So micro drones... You don't need to register them, so you don't have to talk to Transport Canada about them. There's no pilot certification required, and there's very few rules. There are a few rules, but the main thing is, is not to do anything stupid. Don't fly near airports. Don't buzz over people's heads. Don't fly at a concert or things like that. Just be reasonable and, and, and don't do anything stupid. And I'll get into a little more detail on what that means. The next layer up in terms of risk is what's called a basic operation. And this is any sort of a flight that where you're well aware away from airports or heliports and you're flying a drone between 250 grams and up to 25 kilograms. For that, there's four main rules. Number one is to register your drone, which means you apply through Transport Canada. It's $5. It lasts the entire life of that drone. Uh, so it's a one-time fee. The next thing is that you need to pass an exam to get your certification. It's a basic RPAS pilot exam. It's $10, it's online, it's open book, it's it's uh, multiple choice, and it's the passing rate is only 60%. So it's not rocket science. It's a little strange though, because the exam covers things that are way outside what you you would ne generally need, uh, need to know from a droning perspective, because it talks about um, the whole aviation experience, so manned aircraft and, and controlled airspace and terminology like that that you might not be familiar with. So it's it's really important to understand that. And I'll talk about some resources that we have available to, to help you understand and to get through that exam. So register your drone, get your pilot certificate, 
And then stay away from airports, heliports, and controlled airspace. And you're going to say, well, how do I know where they are? And how far do I have to be? And all this kind of stuff. There's a, there's a million different rules. It's, 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 I don't want to say ridiculously complicated, but it is complicated. So there's some tools available that make it super simple. Uh, and I'll talk about those in a minute. Stay 30 meters away from people who are not involved in your operation. So if you're standing there with your family and they know you're flying a drone, you can fly over their heads or pretty close to them, uh, as long as you're not doing anything stupid. Um, but if there's somebody, if you're flying in a park, for example, and there's there's somebody having a picnic, they don't know you have a drone, you have to stay 30 meters away from them, on basically 100 feet. And lastly, you have to stay under 120 meters above the ground. So that's about 400 feet. All right, so that's a basic operation. The next layer up in terms of complexity and risk is what's called an advanced operation. And this is where you're actually near an airport or a heliport, or you're a little closer to people. So in this case, again, you have to register your drone. It's the same registration, but you do need to pass the advanced pilot exam to have your advanced um, pilot certification. And it's not only an exam, and this exam is, is it's a doozy. It is really, really hard to, to pass this exam even though it's online and open book and multiple choice, the pass rate is very high and you don't have a whole lot of time to get through it. In addition to the exam, to get your advanced certification, you need to pass an in-person flight review. So you actually have to meet up with a real human being who's looking at you and watching how you're flying, making sure you have checklists and, and checking all the rules and stuff before you actually fly. Um, and then in order to fly near in this complex environment, near airports or in controlled airspace, you need to secure approval to, to fly in that kind of an area. You can, however, fly up to five meters away from people. So fairly close, that, that's only like 15 feet. That's pretty close when you're flying a drone, but you still do need to fly under 120 meters above ground level, all right? And then lastly, there are more complex operations or more risky operations involving either very heavy drones, like a, a cargo carrying drone, for example, over 25 kilograms, or in a situation where you're flying um, in a, at a, what they call an advertised event, such as a concert or a sporting event or anything like that. Any sort of event like that, you need to have what's called a Special Flight Operations Certificate, an SFOC. And you get that by applying to Transport Canada. It's not easy to get, but it is doable. And you need to be aware of the situations where you need that kind of a certificate to fly. Okay, so those are the four levels of, of risk and the corresponding very simplistic rules. But there is one rule, one regulation that applies to everybody, no matter how small you're flying. Even if you're flying this little tiny drone, you need to be aware of this, this rule. It's called 900.06, and it says, no person shall operate a remotely piloted aircraft system in such a reckless or negligent manner as to endanger or be likely to endanger aviation safety or the safety of any person. And what that means is you need to stay well aware away from anywhere that manned aircraft are flying or even might be flying. So for example, I live in Ontario. I actually live on a lake. And, you know, you'd think, well, there's no airports around. The nearest airport to me is, I think, 15 kilometers away. But there's seaplanes that fly and land on my lake. There's helicopters that sometimes come in surprisingly low. And I need to be aware of that. And I need to be have my ears open at all times for any kind of strange thing that might be going by near my, where I'm flying. So manned aircraft, you need to be careful of. And second of all, you need to be not reckless around people. Don't buzz over people's heads. If somebody is annoyed with you flying your drone, get away from them, land and move on. You know, just be, be nice. You know, droning should be fun. And the better reputation we can all help with uh, in terms of creating a good reputation for drone pilots, the better. So a few other important rules. 
always keep your drone within visual line of sight. And that came up in Joey's talk and the, the question from the audience. And that's a really, really important uh, thing to know. And visual line of sight means that you can see with your own eyes, or if you have glasses, that's okay too. But you should be able to see your drone where it is in the sky. You should be actually able to see it. It does not count to be looking at your controller and being able to see the camera view. I mean, that's good too. That's that's definitely an aid, but you need to be able to see your drone where it is. That's That's the rule. Second of all, don't fly over people, especially crowds. This is where risk can really happen. These drones are very safe, especially the DJI ones, but even other drones as well. They're very reliable, they're very safe, but things do go wrong from time to time. I had a drone about uh, five years ago, a Mavic 2 Pro, so a DJI drone, very good, solid drone. Its compass went crazy on me. In the middle of a flight, the compass, instead of saying it was looking this way, it was thought it was looking the other way around. The drone went berserk. It went up to 90 kilometers per hour straight away from me. Fortunately, right down the middle of my lake. So very thankfully, I didn't hit anybody, didn't run into a tree or anything like that. But it went wrong. And it wasn't anything I was doing. It wasn't anything about the environment, as far as I can tell. It just went nuts. So technology is wonderful. Technology is a great aid to us. But as a couple of people mentioned before I came on, you can't rely upon it 100%. You have to be ready and able to take control at any time. Don't fly in restricted areas, such as near the parliament buildings, prisons, Niagara Falls, national parks. Um, and these are... Um, they're not very consistently um, applied. The different the distances uh, in each case is very different. It's very complicated. You can't tell just by looking on a regular map and saying, oh, there's Niagara Falls. I won't fly over that. The, the distance from Niagara Falls, for example, is I think about two and a half kilometers in radius around that area. So there are tools available, including my own Drone Pilot Canada app that shows exactly where these areas are and it shows you the precise outlines. And when you click on them, it'll tell you the rules that apply to that particular area. Now, somebody's gonna say, well, the DJI drones have that built in through this, the FlySafe maps. Well, the FlySafe map for DJI drones, and, and I'm not knocking that, that system because it's a terrific aid, but it does not, absolutely does not correspond to the Canadian regulations. For example, it will give you a warning when you're flying near one of these places like Niagara Falls, but it will not stop you. It just says, are you aware that you're flying in a CYR 505 zone? Click yes to, to say you're okay. That's not enough in my opinion. It really should stop you or require you to have authorization to fly in that area. And even around airports, it gives great visualizations of some, and I'll even say most airports, but it doesn't have them all and it doesn't show the regulations as they apply in Canada. So the DJI FlySafe uh, system is a terrific aid, but you can't rely upon it. You need one of the official tools, and I'll, I'll tell you about those in a second. Fourth thing to be aware of is you cannot fly near any sort of emergency area, like a car accident, a fire, any sort of thing like that. There could be other first responders flying drones in that zone and you do not want to interfere with that. As wildfires. I mean, you guys in Alberta are, are plagued with wildfires. I really feel for you. And I saw it in, in the news the other day that the wildfire season has opened as of February 20th in Alberta. You cannot be anywhere near a wildfire. I, I wish I had the number at the top of my head. I think it's five nautical miles, roughly 10 kilometers, that you have to stay away with any drone from a... The, from the perimeter, like anywhere there's any sort of fire, smoke, or anything like that, away from that wildfire. And uh, it's obvious why, because there's not only drone, other drones flying there to, to help monitor the fire, but there's water bombers and there's helicopters flying in those zones. They do not want to run into your drone. And um, because if they do, they could suck it into an engine or knock out 
one of their rotors on a, on a helicopter and there could be a huge disaster. And at the very least, they're going to be distracted if they see your drone and start flying in a man, you know, in a manner that doesn't make, uh, isn't helping the situation on the ground. So stay away from emergency areas. Do not be tempted to be the, that guy that, that took the, uh, the picture of the, the building on fire or, or whatever. Next thing, and I think Joey also touched on this, respect other people's property and privacy. Now, this isn't, strictly speaking, a drone rule. This is just a, uh, a regular people rule. You can't fly from private property unless you have permission of the, the property owner. Sometimes that property owner is the city or the municipality where you're living. And you can't violate people's privacy. If they're in their backyards where they have a reasonable expectation of being in a private location, you can't be taking pictures of them or taking video of them. If you're a million miles away and there's a, they're a speck on the top of a mountain, you're not violating their privacy. But if you're taking a picture of somebody around their backyard pool, you definitely are. So respect people's property, respect their privacy, and you'll everybody will be happier. And lastly, have fun. That's in a very important rule in my in my book, at least. Now, I mentioned a couple of tools and, and uh, other mechanisms to be aware of these things. Um, I run an association called the Drone Pilot Association of Canada, or DPAC. That's the, the logo on my shirt there. And uh, DPAC was formed a couple of years ago now. We have in the order of 7,000 members across Canada. It's free to, zone, to join. It's absolutely free. All of our resources are free. Um, and we, what we're representing is rather than commercial drone fly, uh, pilots, you know, like cargo drones and things like that, we're actually representing recreational and what we call small commercial drone operators, people who are doing real estate shots or, um, you know, doing marketing shots, say, for example, Joey. Um, and what we're really striving for is we're advocating with Transport Canada to have a reasonable regulatory environment in Canada. So DPAC is free to join. We offer many free resources and we're really welcoming to, to folks who uh, want to fly. One of the biggest resources that we have is called the DPAC safety course. And this is an image on the right-hand side of the page here of, of that course. Oh, sorry, that's not it. That's our webpage. Um, and that DPAC safety course covers a lot of the material I've talked to today, but goes into a little more depth and it has links to more information and more videos and things like that that will help you uh, uh, get through that. The DPAC safety course is not a, um, a, a Transport Canada course uh, or anything like that, but it is a terrific resource that will help you understand what the not only the drone rules are, but also good practices, best practices for flying your drone in Canada. Um, I mentioned that we have about 7,000 members. We have 2,800 officially, and we have another 7,000 on our, our uh, Facebook page. So the website is, well, you can just Google Drone Pilot Association of Canada. And if you get a PDF of this presentation, that will be a live link at the, at the bottom there. So I mentioned the, the, the safety course. It provides a great introduction to the safe and legal drone and RC aircraft use in Canada. I should mention that, that... I talk about drones and everyone talks about drones, 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 but the same set of regulations for RPAS, remotely piloted aircraft systems, apply to remote control aircraft, the traditional um, model aircraft that uh, started this whole hobby many, many years ago. So the safety course covers the rules, knowing the drone, knowing yourself, where to fly, privacy, best practices, things like that. We have quizzes along the way. And at the, by the way, at the end of this, you get your own certificate to say that you've passed this course and it actually works as a what's called a recency requirement because when you get your official pilot certificate for your drone, it is applicable for, ever, for two years unless you take a recency uh, event, if you, they call it. And this safety course qualifies as one of those recency events. So it's, it's very cool. What just happened? Oh, damn it. I just clicked on the link. <laughs> Sorry. Just a minute. Let me find my way back here. Here we are. Okay. So I mentioned some useful tools and I want to highlight three of them. Uh, the first two are free. 
The first one is the drone site selection tool. This is put out by the actual, by the NRC, the National um, NRC, National Research Corporation com Company Commission. Uh, it's actually a website, not a not an app per se. And it's great because it, it's free and it identifies the no-fly zones related to air, airspace and aerodromes. They also have provincial, uh, sorry, national parks on there. The Nav Drone app is put out by Nav Canada. Nav Canada is the organization that actually controls our airspace for manned aircraft and for drones. They have an app and they have a website. It does the same thing as the drone site selection tool in terms of identifying airspace and aerodromes. It also shows where no TAMs exist. These are temporary no-fly zones that the that Nav Canada puts up around. Um, bad events, I'll say, like forest fires, wildfires, um, major e events like emergency events. For example, the the truckers protest in Ottawa had a no tam uh, around it a couple of years ago, uh, and things like the Grey Cup have typically have no fly zones identified around them. You can see them on the app, and the Nav Drone app is the only one you can use to get authorization for flying in controlled airspace for drones over 250 grams. So you might say, well, why would you pay $60 for Don's crazy thing called Drone Pilot Canada? Well, the reason is, is that it's it's a much more broad tool. It covers not only the, the airspace and aerodromes restrictions and the NOTAMs, but it also covers all of the requirement, other requirements that you need to meet the Transport Canada regulations, and including storage of your documents like your pilot certificate and, and drone registration. It includes all the checklists and procedures that you need to fly these larger drones. It allows you to keep track of your flight logs and your maintenance logs, and it allows you to do site surveys, which is another thing you need to do for the larger drones. And this is good for flight planning and all sorts of things like that. So it's a much more user-friendly application than NavDrone. It's a one-time fee to, to purchase it, and people love it. People absolutely love it. So um, the other resource, and uh, yes, I'm tooting my own horn, but you know you know what? If, if you don't toot your own horn, no one else is either. So I have this YouTube channel con called Don Drones On. I offer free video training for all of the the exams, and as well as best practices. So um, it's a complete range of training. They're free. And tens of thousands of people have used my my training videos um, rather than go to ground schools and things like that to learn all of this stuff. So I have a study guide for the basic exam, a study guide for the advanced exam, study guides and other videos to talk about how to get your flight review done, I talk about all this weird terminology like airspace and airports and aerodromes. And I have I have videos that zoom in on specific elements like, well, what regulations really do apply to the DJI Mini 4 and, and other drones like that? So this is my YouTube channel over here. There's a link to it here. And I have a, a what I call a, a free training roadmap to make your way through all of my videos. I do sell material on this, but it's totally optional to buy the PDFs. These are basically uh, study guides that go along with uh, the, the basic exam and the advanced exam material. But uh, those are totally optional. And I appreciate people who support me by, by purchasing those things. And they do people do say that they are extremely helpful in making your way through the exam. Okay, and I think that's it. Yeah, it is. So I will open it up to... Okay. Just so we can, uh, yeah, yep. yeah, just one sec, Don. We're just going to quickly share her screen. There. There we go. I can't hear you now, Joe. Don, can you hear me? Joey. Don. 
<laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Awesome. Great. Well, yeah. Thank you, Don, for <laughs> the amazing information. He really is a resource. And, you know, the way I came in contact with him was exactly what he was referencing, studying for the basic um, flight examination. I had to take it twice. First time I thought, oh, this could be easy. And then didn't study, took it, didn't go well. And then my dad said, hey, Don drones on. And I said, who's Don? Why does he drone on? And show me his channel. And <laughs> Watch his videos and then pass the second time. Now, now you know why, why I drone on. Yeah, exactly, Don. So, um, no, definitely really handy uh, resource for sure. If you guys want to check out my YouTube channel, it's uh, Joe Man's Land. I've also got a website as well. I don't have any drone resources. I've just got galleries of some of my content I create. Um, I do a street photography course. If you guys are into that, uh, it is on my website. And there's a free pocket guide as well if you're wanting to kind of get some cheat sheet tips on uh, how to do street photography and there's also a live cast at the camera store as well but i think maybe now would be a good time uh, to open up to the floor to questions yeah we do have some online as well but we'll pass you the mics or online people can hear you hi uh good morning or after yeah it's afternoon where you are don uh, with respect to uh, model airplane clubs, so I'm going out into the fixed wing world here, okay? And by the way, people appreciate that you can do some of the great work that we've seen from Joey on a fixed wing aircraft as well. Yeah? Okay. Um, so my question, uh, is there any possibility of Transport Canada exempting operations up to the 25 kilometer limit in controlled airspace within the confines of the club. I'm thinking here of the Airdrie uh, modelers, uh, which is just on the edge of Calgary International controlled airspace. Is there any possibility yeah, yeah, that that's a, Canada in the future it, it, might say? Yeah, that, that's that's, that's a great way. question. Uh, um, just to set the, the context, really when the rules that we're living under right now came into effect in June of 2019, the Model Aircraft Association of Canada, I think that's the right acronym, MAC, um, ha was granted an exemption for those flying at the MAC fields, following the MAC uh, rules, and un you know basically within the MAC, uh, uh, I'll say infrastructure, were exempted from the Transport Canada rules as long as they were following the MAC rules. And the reason for that is Transport Canada recognized, accepted, and appreciated the, the fact that the MAC rules were just as strict, in fact, in, in some cases more strict than the Transport Canada rules. And as long as fixed wing aircraft, the RC aircraft were flying on their fields within the altitude limits and so forth that were defined for that field, everything was great. Now, in at the beginning, I'll say the beginning of 2023, it might've been the end of 2022, uh, the MAC or organization ran into some troubles. Transport Canada uh, removed that exemption. And um, so all the RC aircraft folks that were enjoying the MAC exemption um, uh, had to follow all the Transport Canada rules instead, including getting pilot certificates and registering uh, 20 or 30 aircraft that they had in their, their collection. It was it, It's really a bad situation. And that exemption has not been um, renewed yet. Um, but so so that's the context. So is it possible that the exemption will come back? I would say absolutely. Transport Canada has repeatedly said that if a proper application is made by the MAC organization, or for that matter, any organization, for a, an exemption with justification and all the rest of that, that Transport Canada would grant an exemption. Now, I'm not involved in the MAC organization, so I can't speak for why that hasn't happened yet, but is it possible? Absolutely, it is possible. It could be in a controlled airspace. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I mean, 
For myself, no. Um, yeah. You know, uh, the reason I bought my Mini 3 Pro is I wanted more flexibility with where I could fly. Um, when I had my Mavic Air, I did do the basic certification, registered it, did that whole thing. Um, and I found out at that point, oh, okay, City Calgary, nope. Provincial Parks, nope. PLUZs, some areas, yes. Longview, yes. You know, it, it really, uh, yeah, limited where you could go. So for me, I, you know, I'd probably get about 28 minutes per flight with just a standard battery in good conditions, 30 minutes, 20, 20 to 30. And for me, that's enough. I just carry a second battery. That being said, I do see flights done around Calgary um, on social media that are with the extended battery and they're from folks I know that don't have permits. So yeah, you know, I would just say, use your best judgment, it's user discretion, but um, for myself at least, uh, the standard batteries are more than sufficient. And to Dawn's point with the line of sight rule, I'm not flying far enough away that I can justify needing the extra range, so. I have a couple online questions. Yeah, and just to set, uh, for those who might not be aware, I'll just, I'm, I'm gonna take myself off of blur here. <clears throat> Excuse my messy office area here. So. This is a Mini 4 Pro, and there's a battery, <clears throat> excuse me, a battery in the back. This is the standard battery, just goes in there. And that 250 gram limit that we're talking about is the whole drone put together with the with the battery, with any ND filters that you have on the on the front of it, and any other payload, like if you're putting a strobe light on there or anything like that, it has to be under 250 grams to qualify as a micro drone. So the Mini 3 and the Mini 4 drones have an alternative battery that you can buy that gives you about, I think it's 10 minutes of extra battery length or, or flight time. This gives you about almost 30 minutes on its own, the standard one. And so you can get up to roughly 40 minutes with the extended one. But when you put that extended guy in there, it's heavier and you're no longer a micro drone and you're subject to all of the regulations that apply to uh, drones over 250 grams. Myself, I only have the standard battery, so it's under 250 grams. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I don't know about you, Joey, but I get tired after about 20 minutes of flying. I want to come back, land. If I'm going to change my battery, fine, but at least I, my thumbs need a little bit of a break. I find a 20-minute flight plenty long enough to do what I want to do and still have fun. Self, um, you know, I, I don't usually use this as my only camera, right? Like I'm using my S5 II with some different lenses, my ZV-1 shooting different angles, and then I'll pop this up just to get some BTS, right? So, you know, I think at that point, it, it, you have to kind of think, all right, is it really worth adding that extra weight, getting the permit, getting all the extra rules? For some people, it might be. Um, and by fine, typically with this drone, I'll use the same battery for multiple flights because I'll be in different locations. Right, and you know, when the older drones, for sure, I think you know you run into some different battery limitations. Like when I have a Mavic Air, I had three batteries. I had the Fly More combo, and I think I was averaging 15 minutes per flight. So in those instances, when you're on a road trip, it's like okay, maybe now I could see the extended battery being good. But if you've got access to constant charging and you can, you know, reduce those up, you know, I, yeah, I, I think it's pretty sufficient. But, but, but like you said, in, in the Fly More kit, you get this little battery charger unit, and you can you get three batteries. So if you're getting low, you come back, you land, you throw in a new battery, and and off you go. And you know you can use this as a battery bank. It tells you how full your batteries are. You can I don't know you can see the flashing lights there. Apparently, I need to charge this. Um, and uh, yeah, and I, I always label my batteries, by the way, just so I know I'm rotating them and kind of getting even usage. Question from our online viewers. Um, so can you fly a micro drone into the edge of one nautical mile rule of a heliport or hospital if you fly it with caution, meaning you're fully aware of, um, you may have to get out of there at a moment's notice, stay low and use good judgment. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the short answer is yes, you can fly a micro drone within the, the proximity limits of both heliports, which is one nautical mile, roughly two kilometers, or within the three nautical mile or yeah, three nautical mile limit of uh, a regular airport or roughly six kilometers, 5.6, I think it is. 
So yes, you can, as long as you don't do anything stupid. So if you hear a helicopter coming in, um, you know, especially around like a hospital where a lot of heliports are, um, land your drone, get it the heck out of the way. You do not want to be interfering with any manned aircraft at all, but be aware of what your environment, be aware, keep your ears open. Ideally, like if you're doing a real estate shot, if you can get somebody to come along with you to keep your keep their ears open, because if you're concentrating on your camera work, then you could easily miss something, something happening around you. But yes, you can. To John's point, though, like keep in mind different times of day as well, right? So like the city of Calgary, for instance, if you're wanting to get some shots during golden hour, try to pick a time of year to do that when golden hour isn't rush hour because you're going to have a lot of helicopters going overhead for traffic reports, right? So like that's something I try to avoid. It's like, why, why put yourself in that situation where you're freaking out about your drone being there and you're endangering people, right? So, you know, to anyone watching this live cast, I think just the biggest thing you can take from this is just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. And we all need to work together to keep this exemption we have on micro drones possible by doing what Don's saying. Be smart, be conscious of what's around you and don't ruin the hobby for everyone just to get some photo like there was that video you did a while ago dawn about that guy that was dive bombing the um was it the uh obelisk in um, dc and it was a canadian pilot and he was dive bombing it wasn't even a good shot not that that should justify it but he didn't have permitting he didn't have anything he somehow he didn't get in trouble but that's how new rules come into effect right japan put in rules after someone flew a micro drone into their uh president or prime minister is it japan prime minister yeah, Prime Minister, yeah, flew a, a drone into the head of the Prime Minister. So now they've got way more restrictive rules. So it only takes one person to ruin it for everyone, right? So as a community, we need to hold people accountable, right? When you see someone breaking the rules, say like, hey, man, like, I know that you shouldn't be doing that, right? Like, it, it, don't confront people. But, you know, we need to work together to make sure we keep this space safe for everyone so we can keep having fun flying. Have one more and that's one that's a great thing about the drone pilot association of canada's um facebook page it's a very you know a lot of people hate facebook including myself but that facebook group is closely monitored it's very friendly and welcoming people ask what what on other facebook question pages you might get that oh, it's a stupid question well no you can ask any question on our facebook group um and People will jump in and give you all the answers and help that you might possibly need. So if you have a question like, well, can I really fly in controlled airspace with a micro drone? People will help you. They will answer your question very quickly and might point you to a video, probably one of mine. But, you know, you'll get your answer very quickly and in a very friendly manner. It is a community. Well, thanks so much, Don, for taking the time to answer all of these questions. Um, if you have more, as he said, you can find his YouTube channel. Um, if you registered for this event, we'll also send you all the links to the content that they were discussing. Um, so check that out. And thank you to Joey as well for sharing some awesome creative ideas and hopefully getting people experiencing drones more. And if you're here today, you can also chat with Yannick from DJI. He has some cool toys to check out. Uh, but thanks so much for everyone for watching and for everyone here at the camera store. We'll catch you again very soon. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, guys.